In this module, I'll introduce you to the basics of object-oriented programming in Tikal. Object orientation is a paradigm that changes the way we create programs. In object-oriented programming, we have to think about our programs as a collection of interacting objects. An object represents a thing, such as a file on the file system, a network request, or an image on the screen. Each object has its own identity and may have certain states that change over time. Let's consider a car. A car has a color. It may have a petrol, diesel, or electric engine. Most cars come with a basic solid color such as black or white, but there are also metallic or matte finishes. The car's color and the engine types are fixed properties, while other attributes such as the car's position or speed can change. Changing the state of an object doesn't necessarily change the state of other objects. If we have two objects representing a red and a blue circle, changing the color of the red circle doesn't affect the blue one. But there are also objects that know about each other and interact when necessary. If one object changes its state, it might trigger another object to change its state too. In addition to identity and state, objects also have their own behavior. The behavior of an object defines what it can do. For example, a file object may expose operations such as open and close, as well as read and write. In object-oriented programming, we encapsulate the state of an object and the operations that can change the state in a class. A class is a logical entity that defines the properties and operations. You can think of a class as a plan, a description of an object. A concrete object is a realization of this blueprint. The way we define our objects depends on the level of detail needed to solve a particular problem. Sometimes a higher level abstraction will suffice. We could say, this object represents a person who has a name and a social security number, without considering details like the person's height, weight, or eye color. At the other extreme, we could define an object down to its tiniest components, such as its molecular composition. In object-oriented programming, we typically start with a rough class definition and add more detail as necessary. All right, it's time to get our hands dirty. Let's see how we can create classes in Tickle. We've seen that objects are an instance of a class, and a class is a blueprint for creating objects. In this video, we'll see how we can work with classes and create our own objects. Let's look at an example of object-oriented programming regarding video game characters. In this game, we can control a player character that has certain properties such as its name or position on the map, and each character can perform actions such as moving around or firing a weapon. A class called Hero would provide a blueprint for what the player character looks like and what it can do. Let's start by creating a new class called Hero. I've gone ahead and created a new file in VS Code and saved it as class.tcl. In Tickle, we can create a class using the OO double colon class create command. The OO prefix means this is a command in the OO namespace. OO is short for object oriented. Now type the following line. OO double colon class create hero. So far, this command has created an empty class. The new class has no state and no behavior. That is, we haven't defined any properties or actions for the hero class yet. In object-oriented terms, properties of a class are called attributes or data members, and actions are called methods. We can define data members and methods using the class definition script, which can be passed as a second argument to the OO class create command. We'll define three properties that represent the hero's name, armor level, and hit points. We'll use the variable command to create these data members as follows variable name, variable armor level, and variable hit points. Next, we'll define the behavior, in other words, the methods of the hero class. Heroes can attack and defend themselves. So let's add the attack and the defend method. We create methods inside the class definition script through the method command, which works similarly to the proc command we use to define custom commands. 
will print out messages that match both actions. Note that I use backslash T to insert a tab and indent the message. Before we can start using this class, we need to provide a way to initialize its data members. The initialization of data members is done through a special method named constructor. The constructor gets automatically executed when a new object is created from this class. To declare the constructor, we use the constructor command inside the class definition script and provide the parameter list that should match the data members we want to initialize. In this example, I am going to initialize all three data members using the constructor's arguments. So let's add hero name, hero armor level, and hero hit points to the initializer parameter list. And now let's set the three data members. Set name value of hero name, set armor level, value of hero armor level, and set hit points, value of hero hit points. And finally, let's print out value of name created. There's another special method, the destructor, which gets called when the hero object is destroyed. We can define the destructor to perform cleanup activities such as removing temporary files or closing connections. Inside the class definition script, the destructor gets defined using the destructor command. We'll simulate the cleanup activities by creating a destructor that prints a cleanup message when called. Note that the destructor does not accept any custom parameters. Next, we'll see how to instantiate an object from the hero class and start using it. The hero class lets us create as many instances as we want. Every hero object will have its own name, armor level and hit points, and each instance can attack or defend itself independently. We can create instances of the hero class by invoking the new command on the class itself. Let's first create a variable called orc. We'll assign it the value returned by the hero new command. New passes its arguments to the constructor. So we need to make sure we provide the hero's name, the initial armor level, and the hit point value when constructing our instance. Orcs have heavy armor, so I'll set the armor level to 90. And hit points say to 85. The second variable represents the king, so I'll name the variable accordingly. We'll use the same command, hero new. The king's name is Torvald. His armor is lighter, I'll set it to 80, but he's stronger than Gozak. We'll set his hit points to 95. We've created two hero objects. That wouldn't be very useful if we didn't do anything with them. We can invoke their methods using the following syntax. Object, method, arguments. Let's simulate the combat between the king and the orc. We'll invoke the attack method on the orc object first. Orc attack. The king notices the orc's attack and defends himself. King defend. Then he decides to attack Gazak. King attack. The king's sword glints as it cuts through the air and Gazak is defeated. To get rid of an object, we need to call the destroy command on the object itself. Destroy calls the object's destructor. Thus, we'll see the cleanup message when the orc object is destroyed. Destroy also frees up the memory allocated to the orc instance, so we can no longer access it. Trying to invoke any of its methods will result in an error message. Ok, let's comment this out to fix the error. We'll talk about data hiding next. The king was victorious, but he also got hurt. His armor level and hit points should reflect the damage he sustained during the fierce battle. However, we cannot access the corresponding data members directly. Data members can only be used within the class that defines them. Those data members are hidden from the outside world. Data hiding is a fundamental concept in object-oriented programming. Its purpose is to avoid uncontrolled access to the object's internal data by clients. Imagine if clients could freely change the value of a hero object's armor level and hit points. They could manipulate those values and turn their heroes into gods, or accidentally set their heroes' hit points to negative values. Accessor methods allow us to control what clients can do with our object's sensitive data. An accessor method either returns the value of a data member or sets it. 
This is a good time to introduce gather and setter methods. Having setters and gathers allows us to perform additional validations and conversions before setting or retrieving the value of a data member. Let's implement the setter for the armor level. I'll call the method setArmorLevel. It takes a single parameter, new level. Before setting the armor level to this value, we'll perform a series of validation steps on the input argument. First, we'll check if new level holds a value that's an actual integer. We'll use the string is integer command, which returns one if the argument can be converted to an integer. By default, this command would also return one in the case of empty strings, but the minus strict option disables this behavior. In case this validation fails, we return an error which says invalid argument, expected integer value, got, and the value of new level between quotes instead. We'll then check if new level is positive. Otherwise, we return an error that specifies curses, a negative armor level is not allowed, along with the value of new level. We'll also make sure new level is not greater than 100. In case it's over 100, we return an error message saying, whoa, armor level and the value of new level is too high. And finally, if all the validation checks pass successfully, we can set the armor level. Else, set armor level and the value of new level the gather simply returns the value of the armor level data member. The method takes no parameters and we won't perform any additional checks or conversions in this case. Return value of armor level. You could implement the hit points data member setter and gather yourself. Just follow the same approach we use for armor level. Pause the video and give it a try. Whenever you're ready and decide to check out my solution, just hit the play button. Welcome back. I hope you had a good time. Just in case, here's my solution for the hit point setter and gather. We repeat the same validation steps as in the case of set armor level. If the argument value is an integer, we check if it's positive. We then check if the value is not too big. Finally, if all the validations are successful, we set hit points to the new value. The gather is as straightforward as it can be we simply return the value of hit points. Let's put these new methods to good use. We'll set the king's hit points to 70 and his armor level to 60. And we'll print out the new values. We're relying on the newly implemented gathers. Perfect. Let's now set the king's hit points to minus one. Since the value is negative, we should get an error. That's what we expected to happen. The same goes for setting the armor level to 200. And finally, let's test for non-numeric values. The validation logic works swimmingly. In the following video, we'll cover another crucial concept, inheritance. See you there. Inheritance is another key concept in object-oriented programming. The main idea behind inheritance is to reuse the functionality of an existing class known as parent or superclass and extend it with new functionality in new classes called subclasses or child classes. We'll continue with our previous example where we define the hero class. Given this class, we were able to create king and orc objects. But what if we need a new type of character which, in addition to attacking and defending itself, can also cast spells and heal itself? We could create a new class, wizard, for example, and copy over all the code from hero. That would work, but it's a waste of time and effort. If we want to add something new, we would have to copy the whole class over again. Object-oriented programming provides us with a solution that reduces repetition while still preserving code reuse, inheritance. The idea is simple. Make a class inherit properties and behavior from an existing one and add specialized data members and methods. 
Let's see this in action by implementing the wizard class as a hero subclass. We'll define the new wizard class using the OO double colon class create command as usual. OO double colon class provides the super class command to make one class inherit properties and behavior from another. So let's use this command to make wizard subclass of hero. Next, we'll add the cast spell method to wizard. The method prints out the message to the terminal, which includes the wizard's name. Now let's create a wizard and an orc instance. Gazak throws his axe at the sorcerer. Orc attack. Enzoban dodges the attack. Sorcerer defend. We did not define the defend method in the wizard class, yet it works as expected. That's because wizard inherited the defend method from the hero class. The sorcerer throws a ball of fire at Gazak. Sorcerer cast spell. We've got an error after executing the last command. Can't read name, no such variable. Data members defined in the parent class are accessible within child classes, but this doesn't happen automatically in Tickle. We need to bring them into the scope of the child class using the variable command. Alternatively, we could make it work by using the myVariable statement within the child classes method. And the error is gone. The battle ends abruptly as the orc is turned to dust. The new cast spell method is an addition that's only available for objects of the wizard class. What if we redefine one of the hero class's methods, say defend, in the wizard subclass? Let's try. Since we're accessing the name data member from the base class, we need to make it accessible to this method using the myVariable statement. We'll change the text we print out to white wizard value of name defends himself. And now, if we rerun the script, we'll get the new message printed to the terminal when we invoke the defend command on the wizard instance. Child classes can define methods with the same name as the methods in the base class. If that happens, the child classes method overrides the method defined in the base class. We can also enhance the inherited methods instead of replacing them. In the following example, we'll redefine the attack method by printing a new message. Then we call next, which invokes the overridden method from the parent class. Thus, when calling the attack method on a wizard object, we'll see the following message in the terminal. This concludes our module on object-oriented programming in Tickle. I hope that you've enjoyed it. We'll talk about processes and pipelines next.